Dr. Kroll is a former president and senior Bible teacher for the International Media Ministry Back to the Bible. His Bible teaching and on Back to the Bible radio broadcast is able to be heard in more than 50% of the world's population each day. Dr. Kroll is an author of more than 50 books. His passion to increase Bible literacy in America and provide affordable Bible teaching and Christian theology training for untrained pastors around the world and his clear, incisive teaching of the Word keeps him in demand as a global speaker. He is the creator and teacher of the Helios Project at, Helios, at thehelios.org. Dr. Kroll's greatest joy is preaching the Word of God. He and his wife, Linda, reside in Ashland, Nebraska. They have four married children, 16 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Please watch this from Dr. Kroll. Hi, everyone. This is Woodrow Kroll coming to you from my study here in Ashland, Nebraska, where I live. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address this Gideon Convention with your theme verses. Now, it seems strange not to be able to see your faces or to be able to shake your hand, but the Gideons have done a tremendous job in getting us together on laptops and, and tablets all over the world. So, welcome to this Bible Hour. Now, the theme for our convention today is 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 17 through 19. But before we examine those key verses, let me kind of catch you up on what's going on in these verses. David wanted to build a temple to the Lord God of heaven, but God would not permit him to do so because David was a warrior. He had blood on his hands. So God promised David he would give him a son named Solomon. He was a man of peace, and Solomon would build that temple. So David assembled all the workforce and all the materials necessary for the temple, but then he encouraged his son Solomon to get to the job and get the temple built. Now, here are some selected verses from 1 Chronicles 22, verses 6 through 16, that occur just before our theme verses. Listen to this. Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, my son, the Lord be with you, so that you may succeed in building the house for the Lord your God. Keep the law of the Lord your God, then you will prosper if you are careful to observe the statutes and the rules that the Lord commanded Moses for Israel. Be strong and courageous. Fear not. Do not be dismayed. Arise and build. The Lord is with you. Now, there's several things all of us need to remember as we look at these verses. Now, here's the first thing I want you to remember. Before God commands, God always encourages. God does not send you out on a distribution or anything else without encouraging you. He whispers, you can do this. I will help. And now to the theme verses for our 2020 convention. Beginning at verse 17. David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And has he not given you peace on every side? For he has delivered the inhabitants of the land into my hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and his people. Now set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God, so that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and the vessels that are holy to God may be brought into the house built for the name of the Lord. Rise up and build. You can do it. That's what David is telling Solomon, because that's what God told David. Now, there is this unparalleled command and encouragement, God is with you. Remember, the task God gives you is always easier when you recognize that you're not alone. God is with you. Now, this is a frequent message in the Bible. You find it everywhere. In making a treaty with Abraham, Abimelech said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. Genesis chapter 21, verse 20. See, Abimelech was no dummy. 
he could see that wherever Abraham went, his God went. Whatever Abraham did was blessed by God. Abimelech was quick to enter into a covenant with a man who could always claim, God is with me. God also encouraged Joshua. This is what he said. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. You see, Moses, his mentor, was now gone. Now it was up to Joshua to lead these grumbling Israelites. Was he up to the task? Well, of course not. None of us is. But God wanted Joshua to know that just as he was with Moses, he would also be with Joshua. Oh, and he encouraged our friend Gideon. You remember the passage. The angel of the Lord said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. That's Judges 6, verse 12. And even calling Gideon a mighty man of valor was an encouragement. For when God said this, Gideon was still hiding and afraid. In fact, Gideon's immediate response was, And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? <laughs> we probably all said that a time or two to the Lord God, haven't we? When the prophet Samuel anointed Saul as Israel's king. He said, God is with you, for Samuel 10, verse 7. And as you remember, uh, Saul wasn't a very good king. In fact, his disobedience nullified his kingship. Having God with us to help us is of no benefit if we're not going to follow him. The prophet Nathan encouraged David, saying, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. 2 Samuel 7, verse 3. Now, David was the king that Saul should have been. God was with Saul, but he disobeyed and was defeated. God was with David, but he obeyed and became the sweet singer of Israel, the one blessed by God. Now, the verses that promise God is with you are so many. They're just, there isn't time for us to read all of them. But you'll find verses like that. You'll find promises of God like that in 1 Chronicles 28, verse 20. In 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2. And in 2 Chronicles 19, verse 6. Job 36, verse 4. Zechariah 8, 23, and so many other places. See, it's God's promise to his people. I'll be with you. Oh, but who can forget God's promise to Mary? when the angel announced that she would bear the Christ child. Gabriel said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. Think about it. When God puts a challenge before you, what do you need most to be up for that challenge? You need encouragement. And who would you rather have encouragement from? How about the mighty, almighty, the sovereign God of the universe? Just doesn't get any better than that, does it? As Moses was about to die, he encouraged Israel. And these were his important words. When you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. There's a lot of power in those words. I encourage you today to tap into that power. When you do battle with unseen forces, don't forget you have unseen friends. When the task seems almost impossible, when the odds of victory are high but your resources are low, when you think you can't possibly win, Remember, you're not alone. God is with you. He can do what you cannot. Caroline Sandel Berg wrote the words to one of my favorite hymns. I think many of you will recognize these words. 
Children of the Heavenly Father, safely in his bosom gather. Nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge e'er was given. God his own doth tend and nourish. In his holy courts they flourish. From all evil things he spares them. In his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever. Unto them his grace he showeth, and their sorrows all he knoweth. And then my favorite stanza. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. His the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. God's encouragement to you, Gideon leaders, is wrapped up in this statement. Is not the Lord your God with you? And the answer to that question is, yes, he is. He's with you all the way. But God does more than just encourage us. He makes certain that we understand what is the necessary prerequisite for our success. Now, you are a leader in the Gideon camp. That probably means that you are a person of action, and that's good. The Roman soldiers were men of action. They were Rome. They were invincible, or so they thought. But when Jesus was just a young teen in 9 AD, the Roman armies marched into the Teutoburg forest to engage the wild warriors of the Germanic tribes. Feeling certain of victory, the Roman armies, however, were soundly defeated. Three entire Roman legions were annihilated. Each legion consists of about 5,000 legionnaires, give or take. So the loss to the Roman army was somewhere around 15,000 soldiers. Now think about this. That never happens. But it did this one day in a dense German forest. Roman soldiers were men of action, but they were soundly defeated. In 732, the Muslim Moors marched into southern France, expecting no resistance and receiving none until <laughs> they met the forces of Charles Martel at Tours. Now, the Moors were men of action, but despite their military advantage, they were decisively defeated by the Franks. Being a person of action isn't enough to ensure your victory. When he left Fort Riley, Kansas, which is just about three hours drive to the due south of where I live in Nebraska, he confidently barked this order to those he left in charge. He said, don't change anything until I get back. <laughs> and with that, he rode off to Little Bighorn, Montana. He was a man of action, but General George Armstrong Custer never returned. You see, rushing off to the task without a proper understanding of how to succeed is never a good idea, especially for men and women of action. Now, here's God's necessary prerequisite for success. It's found right here in verse 19 of our theme verses. Set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. Success on the battlefield, God's battlefield, begins before the battle begins. It's up here and down here. Success comes in how you approach the task before you become a man or a woman of action. So, before you get involved in whatever God has for you to do, Ask yourself some questions. And I have to warn you, these are pretty hard questions. Ask yourself, am I prepared to give everything I have to accomplish this task? Or if I'm wounded or experience disappointment, will I continue to fight? How important is it to spend time with God before I meet the enemy? 
Am I taking on this task so I get recognition or so God gets glory? And here's a really tough question. If I fail, how will that affect my relationship with God? Now, this is what it means to set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. Plan your strategies for success in your mind. It's very important. Ask General Custer. Well, I guess we can't ask General Custer, can we? You get the courage for success by binding your heart with God's heart. Moses warned the people of divine punishment if they disobeyed God. But then he encouraged them, saying, But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart, with all your soul. That's Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29. Now, this is not just a principle for when we sin. It's a principle for success in life. Seek the Lord and you will find him. Why? Because the Lord, your God, is with you. So we've learned two life lessons about arising and building. First, recognize you're not alone when you build. The Lord, your God, is with you. And second, before you build anything, seek the Lord with all your heart. Spend time with him. Set your watch with his. Make sure your plans are his plans. Get your mind and your heart prepared for whatever it is God wants you to do. If you want to succeed, you do not have the option of skipping these preparatory steps. First, he said, is not the Lord your God with you? Check. Then he said, set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. Check again. But then comes the precise command of David to Solomon and to you and me. Now we are ready to get up and get going. And God directly says, and very decisively says, Arise and build the sanctuary of the Lord God. See, the task could not be more clearly stated for Solomon. David had prepared many skilled workmen to aid his son. Their skills were unmatched, but they were not the same. Masons could do one thing, carpenters another, seamstresses a third, but they were all necessary. If any one of them failed to take their responsibility seriously, they all failed. One defeat by one person would cause everyone to be defeated. Now, David could not allow that to happen. That's why he began with encouragement. But now, being encouraged, setting your mind and your heart to seek the Lord, all those things David told Solomon were essential preparation, they're all now complete. Now it's time to get up and do something. Now it's time for action. Get up and get going. David says, get up, arise and build. And they said it always that way. We cannot be successful if we simply rush off to accomplish the task God has for us. We need that prep time, that intimate time with God. We need his instructions and his encouragement. But there is a time to get up and get going. We see that often in Scripture. Remember the account in Matthew 28, where the women have come early on Sunday morning to the tomb and they've discovered it empty. Do you remember what the angel said to them? First, he quieted their hearts. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Now, it's true in every language, of course. I happen to be speaking to you in English. You may be hearing this in your own language. But in every language, verbs have a tense, uh, past, present, future. And I want you to notice the tense of the verbs in what that angel told these women. 
First of all, he said, do not be afraid. That's present tense. That's now. He said, for I know you seek Jesus. That's present tense. That's right now. Then he said, you seek Jesus who was crucified. That's past tense. That's not going on now. He was crucified at a point in the past. Then the angel says, he is not here. Again, that's present tense. He is not here in this grave. But then he says, he is not here for he has risen. That's in the past as well. As he said, that's also in the past. See, friends, as Christians, we do not worship a dead Savior. We worship a risen Lord. Now, these ladies needed to have their hearts quieted. <laughs> I mean, after all, think about this. They have experienced two major earthquakes in less than 48 hours. And now they've seen an angel, and he's talking to them. They needed their hearts quieted. But after the angel reassured them, he encouraged them with these words. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Now, did you see the progression there? Come and see. Go quickly and tell. Come and see. Go and tell. No, there's a time to come to see that the Lord is alive. Come and see for yourself that this grave is empty. Get it in your minds. Be certain that you believe in a risen Lord. In your mind, look at that empty tomb. He has risen from the dead. He is alive. Come and see. But once you do, go and tell others what you've seen. I mean, isn't that the Christian commission for all of us? Come and see. Go and tell. We all want to stay by the fire, though, don't we? Sitting in comfort and warmth. But Jesus won't let us sit by his fire forever. It's time to get up and get going. God commanded through David to Solomon to arise and build. And that's our command today. Arise and build the kingdom of God. Arise and build the international company of people who have a copy of God's word placed in their hand. You know, until I retired in 2013, for 23 years, I had the great honor of being the president and senior Bible teacher for Back to the Bible. I traveled extensively during that time. I've been in 112 countries on all seven continents. And everywhere I would go, I would meet pastors who were doing the very best they could with what they had to work with. The problem was they had nothing to work with. 95% of church pastors have had absolutely no training in the Bible at all. 95%. They've also had no training in Christian doctrine or the beliefs of the Christian faith. Can you believe that? It's true. Now, I promise God, if ever I was in a position to help these pastors, I wanted to do so. You know, God has been so good to me personally. I have more than 50 years of searching the scripture crammed into my head up here and 50 plus years of sharing it with others. I wanted to give these untrained pastors all that God had given me. Well, I was only retired four or five days when God reminded me of that promise. He's quite good at that, isn't he? <laughs> it was in that moment let me tell you what God has been doing since I last saw you in the Gideon Convention. In that moment, I created the Helios Projects, which I call my retirement ministry. Helios Projects are a way to train untrained pastors with God's Word. It's both inexpensive, electronically ahead of its time, and it's so easy. The reason I thought about this is our tagline is a Bible and Christian faith education right in your hand. See, the Gideons place a Bible right in people's hands. And in a sense, what I do with the heliosprojects.org is I'm an extension of your ministry. You give them the word. 
I'll teach them what it means and how it applies to their life. Gideon's an auxiliary. God's command is just as clear to you as David's command was to his son, Solomon. First, get rid of the fear and feel the power of that promise. The Lord your God is with you. Second, set your mind and your heart to seek the Lord your God. And once you're ready, get up and get going. David said to Solomon, arise and build. I challenge you, arise and build. Let me say it again, arise and build. Gideon's an auxiliary, arise and build. I'm Woodrow Kroll, thanking you for the privilege of being your Bible Hour speaker for this Gideon Convention. May God bless you all.